start. As I said earlier, my name is Alex Stimson and I am your November webinar uh, host and presenter. So today it looks like we have quite the topic of interest. We have a, a large group attending today, which is wonderful. We're glad to have you all here with us. Um, just a little about, about me and about um, Pro Ergonomics. We are a uh, ergonomic consulting firm and we specialize in ergonomics. And the uh, thing that we I think are most proud about, well, aside from our obviously our webinars, um, we we are all certified and professional ergonomists and registered kinesiologists. So you are getting a fairly decent wealth of, of information and knowledge from each of your consultants that we have. We have a great team and we're very proud of each of us that, uh, that work here. So that's great. We have also shown that we have excellent um, cost savings initiatives with our clients. We've actually done a little bit of return on investment work with some of our more long term uh, standing clients. And we've actually not only shown that um, WSIB costs have gone down, but we've shown a significant decrease to the injuries and claims and duration of those claims that uh, we're really, really proud of. That's something that we're working hard to try and get some of that um, matrix data to be able to kind of present and, and share with some of our, our new clients as well as our, our current ones as well as we believe we have just unparalleled customer service. The webinars are really just something that we do to kind of give back, and uh, we offer those to the public and anyone who wants to come. And I see some familiar faces and names on the attendee list, so I'm glad to see everyone's here. And, um, but uh, yeah, we are, we're pretty proud of, of the company and we're glad that to see you here. So without further ado, if I can get my slides to run properly today. Okay. So as I said, my name is Alex Stinson. I'm a registered kinesiologist and certified professional ergonomist. I have been doing this for 20 some odd years now. It's hard to believe it's gone by quickly. Um, I've been fortunate through my career that I have had the ability to be in pretty much every facet or industry known to man, whether it be, you know, several thousand you know, feet under the ground in the mining industry to your automotive to healthcare and really uh, pharmaceutical, we, we aeronautic. It just, I feel like I can go on forever, so I won't. Um, today's topic is going to be um, Mind Really Matters and the whole cognitive demands conversation. It's definitely a hot topic and as it should be. There is new information and new legislation that is about to come about. We'll be talking about that today. So our outline today really is just kind of review what you already are doing. Everyone here probably has a return to work process in place, is looking at ways to try and improve it and how to make it more comprehensive. And the CDA or the Cognitive Demands really rounds that program out um, and will be potentially higher requirement as we go forward into 2018. So we'll discuss what the CDA is, why we need them and how we can potentially bring them in and use them in our return to work process. We will then be um, in the latter part kind of talking about this upcoming legislation with the WSIB Bill 127 and what are the standards and guidelines out there currently that we can use to help prepare us for for this new legislation and how are we going to best set ourselves in a successful position rather than you know scrambling to try and keep keep up. So the first thing we're going to kind of just go through is the plan. The plan that we all do and know and you know it's part of our daily lives and that's in the unfortunate incident when an employee becomes injured at work. So we have the injury that occurs, we have the diagnosis that gets brought to us as well as the claim that gets started, in which case we then start into our game plan of our return to work process. Now, our PDAs are hopefully something that all of us have done and are happy with, and that's something that we'll pull out then. We then look at the PDA, we look at that diagnosis and that functional abilities information, and we try and match them. So from there, we swerve around and we then try and where we don't have a match, we go into our accommodation mode and we look for ways that can we, can we change the task? Do we, is the task essential? And do we need to offer either different tasks, different job or tools or aids to help the person on their return to work journey? So nothing in this is really going to change. This is all going to stay the same. The only thing that gets added in here is your CDA. Now, 
a lot of the, what I would challenge you to do through the process of today's webinar is kind of ask yourself the question, does my current program support this document? So if you're going to do CDAs, then that's wonderful. And we definitely encourage that, obviously. But do you have some of the other foundational pieces in place, such as um, are your essential duties documented well for your cognitive demands? Are your do you have a functional abilities form? If you do have your CDAs already done, do you have a functional abilities form that speaks to that? Because at this point in time, WSIB does not really have that component married up, but that's, so we have the functional for the physical, but we haven't seen one come out yet for the, the cognitive or the psychological. So as we go through, just kind of maybe start scratching notes on the side and ask yourself, you know, where do I need to kind of beef up my program? Because I don't necessarily recommend that people kind of reinvent the wheel on this. It's, it's just another piece to a program that you're already doing really, really well. So it's just a matter of rounding it out and making sure that we're going to be successful going down the road. So we have our PDAs. We may have a match, we have return to work, we're going to follow the same process with our CDA. So the question is, who has their PDAs done? And I'm hoping that everyone here should be raising their hand. You don't have to raise your hand technically. Um, oh, and I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm just going to sidestep one second because I forgot to start off talking um, just about some housekeeping comments. Um, generally speaking, I have Julie on board with us today and she will be helping to kind of field some of the questions that come up. Um, I think you may have seen that she put a test out um, earlier just to make sure that everyone's uh, all on board. So in the question section, if you do have uh, questions, you are more than willing to kind of post them there. Julie may try and field some of them or um, forward them back to me towards the end of the webinar for me to answer. So in the panel of your webinar, you should have questions. You then have a click down button. If you open that up, you will then have the opportunity to ask questions. Okay, I think that's enough. Okay, so back to our questions. Most of us have our physical demands. Demand, physical demands have been on our table for many, many years. Um, although we still find some of our clients have, you know, some, some of them not done or not done maybe to their to the liking. It's something that we're at least all familiar with and, and we know what we want or where we want to go with this part of the program. So some things that we like to kind of ask our clients is, you know, are your PDAs working for you? So if you don't have a good return to work system where the PDA portion of your program is kind of falling below where you would want it to be, then you may struggle with adding in the CDA component. So that's why we're talking about this just briefly, just to make sure that we have this part of our program well-rounded before we start adding bits and then kind of getting lost in, in the new details. So key things that we come up with, with any kind of, and again, this is also going to apply to your CDAs if you already have them. So are they up to date? It is challenging for any company to kind of prove that they're having, um, you know, they're on top of their physical game or cognitive game if we're showing a PDA or a CDA that's 10 years since it's last been reviewed. Are they objective and quantifiable? So specifically with your PDA, we want to see that they are, there's, there's numbers in there, that they're not just check boxes, but that we actually have weights and times and inches and heights and all of those things, potentially even range of motion, that's going to give you the ability to say when you get a functional that the person cannot lift more than 10 pounds, then you have a document that's specifically going to say, no, there is no 10 pound lifting or handling in this job, so we do have a match. And that way, the process becomes just a little bit more black and white. You know, we all know that this is a very gray industry and or even watercolor, technicolor sometimes, but we definitely want to try and make it as black and white as possible so that it's a little bit more manageable when we do have to go into technicolor that uh, it's only for some things and not everything. So are they objective? Are they quantifiable? With our PDAs, we like to be able to say, you know what, here's your tape measure, here's your stopwatch, here's your scale, kind of prove us wrong. Um, in which case, you know, we're all going to get the same measurements, we're all going to get the same weights, the forces, and all of that. Um, are they valid in that question? So are your measurements able to be represented with someone else's? 
the last piece is really a great buy-in piece and it definitely is something you may want to consider putting into a CDA if you're adding them to your repertoire and that is the sign-off component. Uh, if you can show that it's not just been yourselves as a health and safety or disability management professional that yes you've done this and you believe it's to be true but that you're actually giving it back to the employee or to the supervisor to kind of say yep no this is all correct and it's all comprehensive at the end of the day as assessors we're very much hindered to some degree with what we see and what is presented to us specifically if we're not in the company or on the floor day to day so you may go out you may do a physical demand assessment or have someone come in and do them for you but if that process isn't happening today and when i ask the question okay is there anything else you do and this isn't brought up then that becomes a whole that sign off component helps give some assurance at least that that hole is being filled and that what you have at the end of the day isn't just up-to-date, objective, quantifiable, valid, but it's also comprehensive and the employee or the supervisor agree with it. Okay, so that's kind of the checklist on quality that you want to have for your PDAs as well as for your CDAs as you move forward. So then we're going to go on to who has the cognitive demand assessments completed. So last year we had the whole health care uh, bill change um, as far as WSIB is concerned with the PTSD and first responders. And I think that um, was kind of our stepping stone to where we're going to be for 2018. And in which case a lot of our, our health care and first responder type industries moved to the movement of getting their cognitive demands completed because there was going to be potential that, that the claims were going to come through a little because the legislation had changed. So what is a CDA? Basically, it's in a document that's going to attempt to provide clarity to the level, frequency, and complexity of the essential mental demands or the psychological demands. So often we're looking at less uh, objective data. So where I can't take a, a scale measurement or a height measurement or a, you know put a stopwatch on some of the cognitive demands. So these have a tendency to be a little bit more um, written and descriptive in nature. So we want to make sure that we have standardization within our CDA so that each job is at least being looked at for the same parameters and we're not kind of having a description for one and a different description for another and we're maybe forgetting that there is overlap and similarities between the two because we don't have a standardized form. So try and find yourselves a standardized form that's going to provide you with at least what are your basic elements in the cognitive demands assessment that you are wanting to make sure that you're capturing or conclusively saying no this does not exist as essential mental demand. Now. The biggest question we have, and where I've often come into just challenges, I guess, in some of the descriptors, is determining what is an essential cognitive or psychological demand. Because this is sometimes one of those areas that has come back and, and bitten people afterwards. Because what we need and what we want are sometimes two very different things. So for instance, I have, let's say a, um, oh, I'm trying to think of an example. Let's say a, an assembly line um, operator. And I want to say that there is a high accountability and a high attention to detail. Let's say high attention to detail. Um, you want to make sure that that is the case, that yes, that job does need that high attention to detail because what we'll sometimes want in an employee, yes, we want someone who's punctual, we want someone who has high attention to detail, who has great memory, who has all these wonderful skills, but if we say that the, the ideal employee description is what every job in your workforce requires, now all of a sudden I have someone who potentially has a cognitive claim in process and I've said in the document that yes, this is a high attention to detail when in actual fact the process is so well rounded and so driven and we have quality checks and we have machines with sensors that make sure it's done that actually the attention to detail is low. It's just something we want an employee to have 
but it's not an essential duty. So the whole essential question becomes really very interesting and it's a very interesting um, I guess process for yourselves and your supervisors and your team leads to kind of sit down and go through because often when we start talking and we start going through these cognitive demands, what we'll find is people will say, yes, yes, no, that is absolutely essential. And by the time, you know, we're done the assessment, I've kind of got a flow of and a feel of what the job is. I kind of come back and I'm like, I haven't seen any examples where they need this. And they're like, well, no, I guess, I guess that's just something we, we want. So that's something to kind of go through and start asking yourselves before you do the assessments is what are the essential duty requirements? What is absolutely going to be required to do the job? So we then want to then kind of get some perspective on what the employee feels because they are often the ones that we are discussing the, the, the assessment on and they're the ones that we're kind of interviewing and assessing it becomes very challenging when you just talk to one person and they may have a very, very different kind of social perceptive feel on what their job is. There's some people who do the exact same job. You talk to one person and they will be like, oh my gosh, this is the hardest job anyone has ever done. It is crazy busy. It is intense. And then you talk to the next person who maybe comes from a different walk of life and they're like, oh no, this is this is a dream. You should have seen my last job. So we want to make sure that because this is so much of a bit of a narrative when we're doing this assessment, that we're trying to take as much of the feeling out of it and really looking at not what we want, not what the employee feels, but really what is an essential duty. So what is that? So that is it has to be present in the job in order for the job to be done well and to the degree that you need it to be done. So memory, or the example we have here is computer literacy. You know, we have people that, yes, you use computers all day long, but you're not programming them. You're just on email or in a word suite. So trying to give perspective of if for some reason, um, and this has been one that's come up a lot actually in the cognitive demands for me personally anyways, um, due to the aging workforce. So we've, I've had I think two now where there's been pushback for an employee to do a modified job because of the computer literacy component because they're not comfortable with computers and that's you know, they're, they actually want to do their pre-injury job, but we can't get a match there just yet. So we're trying to find some accommodation. And it's been the computer literacy element that's held us up in the return to work process because they're shutting down saying, no, I can't do that. And everyone would agree that if that job required you to become a computer programmer or coder or, you know, draft high tech AutoCAD drawings or reports or statistical analysis, then yes. Yes, we absolutely do not have a cognitive match there. But if all we're requiring is them to maybe open up a program and click some boxes in inventory or write in some numbers in a spreadsheet or compose an email that doesn't even have to be grammatically correct, then I think we can argue a little bit more firmly that no, the essential duty here is present, but it's not high. The cognitive demand is not so high that he shouldn't be or she shouldn't be able to do it. So. It's very similar to the physical demands component. It just becomes a lot more gray because it's so much more not black and white and physical. At least if with a physical demand, I can say, yes, the lift occurs. Yes, the weight is this. Yes, it happens at this many you know, times a minute or an hour. And this is where it's coming from and where it's going to. With the cognitive, this is where our technicolor comes in. So. I really suggest a first step process would be to sit down with your team and start looking at your job descriptions. Start going there first and trying to identify what are the essential cognitive demands that you require for this position to do. And be as practical and ruthless with that as possible because as I said, if you get into the wants and needs of an ideal employee, you may find that that limits you later on down the road when you're trying to accommodate and return to work. So we want to try and make sure that that is valid and objective as possible. And similarly to our return to work process. 
so we want we have someone obviously if they've gone off due to a cognitive issue they may have a lower cognitive ability than they had before or then and we are essentially trying to match them so if we have for instance a manager who all of a sudden is suffering from anxiety and the confrontational element with dealing with their employees is one of the triggers that sets um, them off and makes their job or, or their their ability to perform less then we need to look at that uh, i had one a similar very similar case almost identical actually <laughs> to that in which case you know we we had a good working relationship and what we ended up doing was the manager position was then transferred over and we were lucky that we even had this ability it was a relatively very large company so they had lots of movement ability for this manager but we moved them to a manager where the title was really manager and name only um, there wasn't a lot of staff there wasn't a lot of confrontation we knew some of the culture and psychosocial issues going on in the in the department and it was a much better fit and we were actually able to get a a job match and still maintain the manager title and salary and everything all that goes with that so looking to try and minimize the gap between low cognitive ability and high mental demand and trying to put into play there what's required as far as the return to work process and how are we work hardening and bringing these things up and reintroducing them and what are the aids and tools that we're providing along the way to help them to be able to achieve this successfully. So, Bill 127, coming January 1st, 2018. Um, for those of you that are not aware, and I'm at this point, I think I'd be maybe a little bit surprised if you weren't. Um, it is now, so the PTSD portion came in, uh, as I said, I think last year, and gosh, it could have even been two years ago now. I feel like time's just flying by. Can you believe we're in November, late November, no less? Anyways, I digress. Um, the traumatic side of the legislation for the PTSD within the healthcare and first responders. And I think that went through first. And I think we were able to really wrap our head around that and just everyone kind of nod their head and go, yes, right decision, right thing to do. Absolutely. Um, and it's not that this bill is not the right decision. It absolutely is. I think it just becomes a little bit gray for people. I use that word a lot today, gray. So there's two components to Bill 127. There's the traumatic mental stress, in which case there is a traumatic event and there's going to be almost a PTSD-like reaction to it, in which case the example that WSIB gives is a grocery clerk is held up at gunpoint. Again, I'm gonna go back to that legislation that the first responders have. I think as a whole, from what I've seen and heard and read, we we have this kind of, yes, I get that. I, I get how I'm going to respond to that. I get how I'm going to deal with that. I have an event. I have a reaction. It all makes perfect sense to me, and I can work within those parameters. So today's talk isn't going to be so much on the traumatic mental health. You'll definitely need your CDA to help with those claims. But just kind of as our brains work, I think that part of the bill, everyone's like, oh yeah, no, no problem. I get that, that's fine. Um, where I think a lot of us are kind of going, huh, hmm, and just maybe scratching our head a little bit. And again, it's not that we think this isn't the right thing to do. Socially responsible decision here is being made, but it involves the chronic mental stress. So this is something that's been building and happening over several years. It could be because of varying, you know, elements or, or aspects to the job, but we're looking at, an example they give is bullying. So we're looking at something a little bit grayer, a little bit un, more undefined. So this is where we're gonna be focusing most of today's session in, which is in the chronic mental stress. So right now, we what is chronic mental stress? Well, it is work-related mental stress that's caused by a substantial work-related stressor or a series of stressors. So what does that mean? Well, as substantial is considered to be in excessive or in its intensity or duration compared to the pressures experienced in every other daily work or life. So you can see just by 
reading that or hearing me say it, that it brings up a lot of questions. It kind of makes yourself go, okay, well, what's substantial to me may be different from someone else and maybe different from another person. And that's absolutely true. And that's one of the challenges we're going to have. We've been working with it for years on the physical side. Now we're going to need to bring that whole kind of what one person is able to do and another is not into place because what is substantial to one isn't necessarily to the other. So there are some exclusions to this. So anything, any of these substantial um, stressors that we're talking about, they are exclusions from things that are kind of performance-based. I've been doing a version of this talk a lot with the HR um, departments and community because I feel like a lot of this is maybe going to come towards them as far as claims and challenges because when you look at these exclusions, termination, demotion, transfer, discipline, changes in working hours and productivity, a good number of those are really occurring in the HR world. All of these things are going to be dealt with through your HR coordinator, your HR manager, your HR team. So we'll start to see some of this disability management focus maybe shift a little bit rather than just be under health and safety where it was in the physical sense because it was a physical hazard. It's now going to broaden and bloom a little bit. So it's just an interesting model change because uh, I know a lot of companies have actually been moving their health and safety out from HR and into more of an operations and this may, may be more reason why it needs to go back to HR. Not that I'm a, I'm a proponent of one or the other. I think both have their, their pros and cons. So, But it's, it's just an interesting that when we're talking about how some of these claims are going to go through and what the mental stresses are, a lot of them may at least start off trying to be something related to a performance-based issue. And the bill is saying that that is not going to be the case. If, if you're not performing based on your job role, then this is something, this is a performance management issue and not a, a claim issue that will be compensatable or compensable, sorry. So the process is very similar, very similar to our physical process right now. We have to have a diagnostic requirement, okay? We need a DSM diagnosis that needs to be provided by a regulated healthcare professional. The one thing I'm finding interesting right now that the first line of defense, and this is being, this is outlined in the bill itself, is your first line of defense is still going to be your general practitioners. So not necessarily individuals that are are strong on the cognitive or sociological side of the medical practice. We're not asking for psycho psychological, or sorry, not psychological, uh, psychiatrists or psychologists or OTs or anyone that kind of deals um, in the cognitive diagnosis realm of things. And we'll start to see that, you know, I think that's going to be a challenge for a lot of us because we've all experienced some of the challenges on the physical side where you know our GPs are basically fed very specific information from employees and the notes come back just as either specific or vague depending on on the parameters where we have you know Mr. Summer off or I've had you know things that are so so specific that only an employee would saying exactly what they wanted written down would have had come back to them so it's going to be interesting these Psycho, uh, psychologist, psychiatrist kind of element is a second tier approach after the diagnosis is given from your GPs. So that's one element that just kind of keep your thumb on that pulse point because that could be interesting and potentially challenging going down the road. So then we have the we have a diagnosis. We have the employees experience substantial work related stressors. And as I said, right now, they're kind of focusing on the bullying and harassment, but there's also obviously going to be lots of others that um, come into play. And we'll talk about some of those because in, in doing this talk for, for several groups now, everyone's, I think, feeling a little bit confident because, again, just like we've had the physical side of our return to work program in place for quite some time, our violence and harassment policies and procedures have also been in place for some time. And depending on our industry and our culture, we may have done some leaps and bounds in that, you know, violence and harassment and bullying 
sector to try and mitigate and reduce those stressors. So I've had a lot of people say, no, 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 we've got this covered in this program and we've got the physical covered in this program. So we don't think that the CDA or the cognitive issue is going to really be that much of a, of a hard battle to win. So that's great. That's wonderful. We don't want it to be, but I'm going to bring up another scenario in a minute just to kind of challenge you and think of, hmm, all right then, now what do I do? So we have the injury process, we have the diagnosis, and we have causation. So it must be work-related and it must have that significant um, content to have, the, I guess, that chronic stress be in place. So here's my food for thought. We're talking about the physical, and this is some, uh, a study that I, I was researching. Actually, I did a, I've done a lot of research since this bill kind of came to light and talked to a lot of different people. And one of the things that was interesting in some of the studies and research that I did is if we do feel that we have it all wound up in our physical and we do have it all, you know, in a nice, clean, neat box for our violence and our harassment, then what about the workers who suffer permanent impairments? So studies have shown that workers who, from a physical, physical injury, so we've already done the return to work process, um, suffer from a permanent impairment, they are at greater risk from suffering from mental illness. So in Ontario, uh, 15,000 workers a year, on average a year sustain permanent impairments. Uh, and it's just one of the studies that I was looking at that was the WIH looked through, and it was the a study of about 500 workers, and all of which who had permanent impairments. And what we found was the staggering number that were reported. So we have 81% of that 500 were diagnosed with depression, 92% were diagnosed with sleep disorders, 96 with medication abuse, and 88 with concentration deficits. So when we're looking at those cognitive demands, we now have someone who we've returned to work. We've already know WSIB has you know, granted the claim and deemed us responsible for the injury. And now we're having kind of post chronic mental health issues as a result. So it's difficult to say that, I mean, and again, we don't know yet. We, the bill hasn't come in and we haven't seen how WSAB is going to handle these, but we definitely, it's going to be hard to say, no, 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 that's not us. That's not work related when we've already had WSIB say, no, no, the injury was work related. So potentially they may grant that the, the chronic mental health, uh, health issue will be as well. So permanent impairments are something we struggle with as it is because as I said, any modification or adjustment to the job is permanent, it's not temporary. Um, and now this adds just kind of an elevated sense of urgency to make sure that, you know, our safety program is really on par and, and there's no blemishes to it so that we're not, so we are minimizing our permanent impairments. So this is the statistics within that group of 500, but what it looks like on a whole, if you take a more broad spectrum look at, well, what does this mean compared to our general population, our more normative data? Um, in general, our normative data, now granted, our normative data is obviously based on reported cases only. So it's not to say that these numbers are set in stone and likely are not. There's probably hundreds of thousands of cases of people that have not even, who chosen not to seek um, therapy or attention or diagnosis and, uh, and have not reported anything. But for on the whole of the reported statistics we do have, 12% of a population is generally um, being diagnosed with depression and that is compared to 38% of someone with a permanent impairment. Sleep disorders, we have 75 for someone who's experienced a permanent impairment versus 48 in normative data. We've got 12 for medication abuse versus two. And uh, same thing, kind of, we see the same trend with our cognitive, you know, 42% for those that are permanent impaired um, at work. So this is where I kind of see it becoming a little trickier. Now, granted, the compensable claims will go forward. They're not retroactive past um, beyond uh, 2018. So this is something that we are going to be moving forward with. But I think it's reasonable to assume that now that the legislation comes in, we will see at least a higher 
intake of these types of claims as the legislation kind of pans out and sorts itself out and in these initial stages. So we'll have to be cognizant of the fact that yes, we have to definitely be mindful of our harassment and our bullying and we need to make sure that our return to work process is inclusive of the cognitive demand element and how are we documenting it, how are we making it objective and how are we able to then cross match someone with low function versus someone with high function or a job that has high function in those areas. So this becomes part of your checklist. This becomes things that, you know, we don't have much more time now. I think when I started talking about this, it was back in June. So people had six months to kind of work on their program. So hopefully people have already started, but we've got, you know, six weeks or so before 2018 rings in and it would be that's kind of where we can start at least making a case of where do our where does our program need to change? Where do we need maybe assistance and help because of the short timelines that we're looking at? And where do we want to start? You know, uh, is there areas where you typically find that this is going to be a higher demand based on the nature of the job? The fact that, you know, your first responder kind of jobs were were almost earmarked or highlighted through the WSIB legislation coming in previously to this is an indication that there is jobs in every workplace that people recognize as being high uh, mental demand. And what are the requirements of those? Because those may be jobs that you, you see a higher risk of, of cognitive demand matching having to happen. So, and then that's kind of comes in, well, we're now we need to try and prove that yes, we do have a match or that no, there was always a match that, the, you know, as I said earlier, when I talk to employees, we often will, um, I think the one that I, I always, I kind of smile at in the back of my head is multitasking. When I get to the multitasking component of a, a job or an assessment, the, the employees are always, oh no, there's, I, it's all multitasking. I don't, I don't stop multitasking. And that's not necessarily true. There's times where we do very task sequence based, sequence based task very quickly, but we don't have the, um, but we are stopping one part of the process before moving on to the next. We are not actually doing two things at once you know so for instance talking on the phone and working on the computer that is multitasking so you have you know your customer service type individuals who yes when they say they multitask multi multitask most of the day they absolutely do and then we'll have other people where you know yes they may be the ceo of the company but you know they're sitting in meetings and they're looking and they may be going through a, a long laundry list of to-do lists but they're not Necessarily, that's not an essential duty. They should be present in the moment. And although they have a lot on their plate, they are handling those issues one step at a time. So trying to find out that are we really getting a cognitive demand that is objective and that when we then do go to match, do we have a functional abilities form ready so that we are able to have a nice, translation of information. It's challenging when you have one form that looks one, and we've, we've dealt with it in the physical realm. You know, we, our PDA looks like this, and it just doesn't translate well to the functional abilities form that we get from the doctors or from WSIB. And I think a lot of companies have worked really, really hard to try and minimize that gap so that one speaks a little bit more clearly to the other so that when we say, yes, we have a job match, we are firm and secure in that opinion and that assessment. So the same thing really should be happening with the functional abilities form. And um, City of Toronto is actually one that has been doing cognitive demands and has a job match form that's been going on for years. Um, I know a, a version of it has been picked up by a lot of the insurance companies, your Sun Life, your Manual Life. They use a very similar version to that one. So it's not that they're not out there. They are. So I suggest that, you know, if you're in the process of building this part of your program, before you rush out and just pick up any CDA form that you, you find that you also look at trying to either build or also find a cognitive demands uh, functional ability that's going to match it well. Otherwise, you're going to struggle with that return to work process. You're going to have all this information and all these boxes filled out, but they don't translate well to a functional abilities form to prove 
that yes, we have a job match or no, we don't, but we do have the ability to accommodate or work hard and, and work with the individual to be able to put them into that position by the time of their, their return to work program or process. So that's number two thing to kind of consider. Uh, the last one is kind of maybe, it shouldn't be the last, maybe it should be the first, but it is developing your policy. So again, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. I think that we can find a lot of success in the programs and elements that we are currently using. If you are of the healthcare nature and you've already kind of got this process in play for your, your PTSD, your first responders, then definitely just trying to broaden that for everyone else in the in the organization but looking at your process to make sure that our policy is now maybe defining a new purpose that's going to encompass the psychological culture or welfare of the uh, employees looking at the definition of what is a traumatic event as prescribed by WSIB as well as the definition of chronic mental illness bringing in or maybe not bringing in, but reiterating and affirming the bullying and the criticism and teasing. So, because I think this is where a lot of people are getting quite worried. You know, someone who feels that they are being micromanaged and they go home every day feeling, you know, lower because their manager or supervisor doesn't, they don't feel that they have a lot of entrustment of, of their abilities in their job could potentially come back and say, you know, this has been affecting my self-esteem. It's gone into play in increasing my anxiety at work because, you know, I just know every day that they're going to come and they're going to hover and they're going to second guess everything I do. And then maybe that's leading to depression. So this bullying, criticism, teasing, I think there's going to need to be a lot of education because it's not quite the same conversation that we had when it was violence and harassment. I think it's a bit more, a bit broader than that. And then bringing in, if you are looking at doing your CDAs, bringing in what that document process looks like. When do we have it done? When is it being done? How is it being done? Who is it doing it? And all of those types of things. And how are we going to return them to work? Is there a functional abilities process in play? Do we have uh, a return to work schedule? Are we able to use the one we are currently using? So don't treat this like a whole new program. Build on what you already have. I think that will make the most sense to your employees rather than feeling like they're being kind of submerged into a brand new system when they're pretty comfortable with the ones that you have currently. So broaden and, and the scope of those programs, I think will allow the transition to these new claims to kind of just be a little bit more smoother and to be understood, I think, to a higher level than if you were to just try and blow in a new program. So your checklist for success is we're definitely going to try and develop and modify our return to work program. What I've been suggesting for my um, HR can, teams or departments is that they maybe try and do some role play, you know, go along and, and pick out, you know, various possible diagnoses that you could be getting in as, as a potential claim and running through that scenario with various jobs and see if a, you know, are we able to use based on the diagnosis, based on the information for substantial stressors, are we able to use this going forward? And then we can then take that out and see where the gaps are in our program and where our, at least our procedure steps and our documentation maybe need to be improved. So that's step one. I challenge you guys all to kind of go out and do a bit of role play, playing and see how your program kind of stacks up and how is it going to work when uh, 2018 comes around and these new claims start to come through. Um, I would definitely work on the communication piece, specifically in your policy. Communication's always been a huge component in the early and safe return to work program. We've always seen and, and shown that continuous contact with the employee has shown better results, where we're kind of going in a new direction potentially with the chronic mental health is 
sometimes that communication needs to almost start before there's a claim. You know, we may have an employee who sits next to me and, you know, they come, they need to know that they can come to you and say, you know what, Alex is just off. And for the last three months, like she's, she's, she never laughs anymore. She's always tired. She's late. She never used to be late. Like there is a ton of kind of key performance indicators that go into, you know, not diagnosing by any stretch of the imagination, but kind of just being indicators that, oh, something's not right here. Um, and maybe we could start the prevention process before the claim even starts. So it kind of goes on to that prevention that we've been trying to do with physical, but the communication piece throughout the employees and how that's going to be disseminated, how the privacy and confidentiality for the employee is going to be entrusted. It's just, it's just different. It's, it's the same, but it's different. And it's going to look different as it comes in because your prevention program really is going to rely on some of the eyes and ears that you have in the workplace so that you're able to kind of get your EAP programs working in the right times and, and maybe help this individual along so that chronic mental stress is not something that they're having to experience. Uh, and then educate. What is your education plan moving forward? Because I suggest that you have one. Um, not to be a negative Nancy, which sometimes I feel like is my nickname. Um, but we, I would expect to see a high influx of these at the beginning stages. It's usually what happens when anything's brought in, we kind of have spaghetti on a wall um, and we kind of will have to go through and cipher, you know, where are our, our legitimate claims? Where are the ones that are maybe not <laughs> as legitimate? And how are we going to filter, filter all of this information that's going to be bombarding us? And education is a good way to start that, kind of going through letting people know what the exclusions are. So yes, if you're demoted based on performance, that is not something that's going to be compensable by WSIB. Um, nor is it something that, you know, we're going to be entertaining as a return to work process because of, you know, poor, poor performance. Um, also going back into specifically your management levels who, who have a huge influence on, you know, how their employees go home at the end of the day. You have your good managers, and we all know there are the ones that maybe shouldn't be managing as much. And uh, looking at some of training and coaching for them to make sure that we're putting forth our best foot forward going into 2018 so that we're mitigating some of the potential, again, excessive chronic mental health stressors. Now, what are the guidelines? Uh, the guidelines that we have that are currently being looked at, um, one I would highly suggest you look at is the CSA guidelines at 100, uh, sorry, 1003. It is the psychological health and safety in the workplace standard. Uh, so if you haven't seen this, it's been, it's out. You can download it actually for free. Uh, however, if you are interested, we, we have it, we can definitely send it to you. One of the things that is in this, and this is one of the uh, elements I've pulled out, there is an audit, there's actually several audits depending on your organization. So if you're small, they have a little bit more of a pared down version, or maybe if you know you have absolutely nothing, you could be huge and just know you're, you have nothing in place for anything of this nature, then maybe you start off with this kind of simple audit. But if you have a fairly robust program and multiple levels of intervention on going along this path, then there is a more in-depth audit as well. So great way of kind of just checking yourself on the psychological health element in the workplace and how that's going to play out. It is repeated numerous, numerous times in this document and I've highlighted it here, and that is, do you have the essential duties, the cognitive or psychological essential duties of your jobs documented, and have you done a psychological job analysis or job assessment, which is essentially your CDA? So it is kind of one of your first lines of defense, as well as it's a great exercise to kind of give you perspective as to what your jobs from a cognitive perspective really look like. Because as I said, everyone has these ideals of, you know, well, of course I want, you know, my employee to have all of these wonderful cognitive skills, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the job demands them. And 
<laughs> the ideal employee is the, uh, called the ideal employee for a reason, but that doesn't necessarily, we all know, may not be the case. So we will look at kind of trying to level that playing field by documenting through your CDA. So if you are interested, um, I would ask that you would email us and we can forward it. I actually have the in-depth audit in a workable Excel um, spreadsheet and I'm more than willing to share that with you guys so that you guys kind of have a working sheet that you can go through. Uh, this is obviously the um, standard is a, is a PDF so it's not overly user friendly when you're wanting to kind of track and sum and get a fuller idea on what you're looking for as far as how are we doing psychologically in the workplace and uh, so more than happy to share that with you guys if you're interested. So that is basically CDAs and the legislation and the guidelines around it kind of in a very one, actually, oh, I'm doing well, 50 minute nutshell. Um, we offer, make offers at the end of each of our webinars and this webinar is you, um, we will honor a one free CDA if you're completing a PDA with us. Uh, if you're interested in that, please uh, let us know, get in touch and we can uh, provide you a code so that when that goes through, you have that offer available to you, put you, at least start you off on the right foot. 2018 is coming quickly, we know, and we want to make sure everyone's kind of in the best position they can to, uh, to go into this new legislation. So if you have questions, I see that we've kind of been going along here and there's been several, so I will try and go through them. I think most of the people have just asked if I can share the, uh, the slides. So I think Julie's probably been touching base with you. Each of our webinars, if you are new to our webinar series, um, we do one every month, but all of the webinars are actually recorded. So, and they, they are posted on the Pro Ergonomics YouTube channel. So you are able to get this one as well as any of the other ones we've posted so far. Um, also, just as a reminder, if you know that the subject matter is of interest, but you know you can't attend, you can still register and when the recording comes out, you will be given that alert and notification so that you know um, kind of where to go from there. All right, so oh, Brenda has her hand up. <laughs> All right, let's just look at our questions. So yeah, if you have a question, just put it into the um, into the question section of the tab. I think most of these look like they are just getting a copy. Yes, Jacqueline, um, I definitely can. As I said, it was the uh, IWH and uh, it was, I think, going back to 2012, but still it was a very interesting study and it was just something that when I read it, I read it just kind of as interesting food for thought for injury claims in general. And, um, and then I was like, wait a minute, I think we will we'll have a hard time kind of showing that this isn't linked to this new legislation coming through. I found it really interesting. I will definitely, um, I, can, I can post that and we can, you can have that available for you. So we don't send out um, the, the, the slides, the slide deck, but we do do the recording. So you can look through that at any, at any time. Um, we, you asked if, sorry, someone asked, Fred has asked if we have access to the um, Toronto um, uh, cognitive demands and functional abilities form. Um, I think we have had a lot of times it's come out in, in sessions that we've attended. So it's not necessarily something that's been provided to us, but we've seen them and kind of worked with them and, and looked uh, at some of the things. I don't have anything I can hand out, nor do I have authority to do so. But um, it, I would recommend you Google 
some of this because if you go into just your images even, you should see some, some images and templates and stuff kind of come up. Uh, and I would imagine, and even a, if you have an insurance provider, your benefits provider, talk to them because my guess is, and from my experience, when I've done the CDAs and worked with the on the insurance side, because obviously they've been doing this longer, they've they've been covering mental mental health claims for for many many years. So um, they sometimes have a lot of this already in place, and they may be able to be able to provide you templates and assist you with some of the, the program growth. Um, we have ours that we do. Um, and we find it's been working really, really well. It's definitely something that I feel not everyone can just pick up and run with it. You do need a little bit of education, a little bit of experience on what the definitions of each of them are, but there's definitely lots of resources out there. So I encourage you to kind of look at who, who you have in your corner to see who can help. So I have one question in the healthcare industry asking if kind of burnout would be something that um, is going to be compensable. And it's possible. I mean, at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself, is these is this essential? In which case, most of the time, you're going to say yes. You know, our nursing staff do crazy long shifts. Um, and, but where you have some give and play there, and um, Sarah Snabel, one of the owners of the company, my business partner, uh, she is our healthcare guru, and she, she talks a lot about this is, you know, a nurse is not a nurse is not a nurse. They're not interchangeable. Where they are within the hospital and what functions they do changes greatly. So the cognitive demands isn't going to be a one document thing in that industry. It's going to be something that changes for the department and the area and the level of uh, management or responsibility that they have. And you may find that you have areas or openings or abilities to kind of still have a work hardening or work um, return to work program and play within that industry because yes it's it's something that you're going to definitely see happen and when the the PTSD uh, first responders came in I know the nursing community kind of was like well what about us we see just as many horrific things um, and it's so it's definitely an area where burnout is a concern so I would definitely look at um, look at that and, and kind of see how you can break that down a little bit. Um, someone else has asked, do we have the city of Mississauga is using? <laughs> oh, sorry. No, I, I'm talking. I thought it was Sarah. So um, Sarah worked quite extensively with the city of Mississauga and uh, they've been using um, a form that's very much built and based on the um, on the City of Toronto's format. Uh, we gave it out at the OMRA conference, so it's something that we could potentially provide as a sample if you're interested as well. Okay, well, I am two minutes shy, so if there are any other questions, um, please let me know. I'll stay on for maybe another five to seven minutes, and if not, our email address is right there, info at proergonomics.ca. Um, you could email me directly. I'm a stinson at proergonomics.ca, but I think info is a heck of a lot easier to, to remember. So we uh, just, uh, yeah, keep in touch. If there's anything that we can help you with, we'd be more than happy to. If you're interested in taking up us up on the November offer, um, we can, if you set it in process, usually they're, they're only valid for the month because we'll be making a new offer in December, so they don't last long. But if you are interested and you want to schedule it, let's say, or, or plan to schedule it for the new year, we would honor it as long as you let us know that you're wanting to make use of that offer for this month. All right. Um, next month, I believe we are looking at, and you'll be, you'll be hearing from me again, so you'll be looking at what is our 2008 strategy for everything ergonomic and where are you and where how are we going to get you where you need to be and where we think some of your best investment dollars are going to be spent it's something we do kind of every year it's like our oprah version of ergonomic webinars but 
we uh, encourage you to attend and kind of evaluate where you are and where you want to be and what you maybe need to get there. And yeah, definitely pick our brains. Hope you guys all have a wonderful day. And if there's anything we can do, please let us know.